Thanks very much for that introduction. Uh, I work for United Technologies, Pratt & Whitney. Uh, United Technologies is a $57 billion company uh, that makes innovative projects that just touch everybody in the world practically. Um, our Pratt & Whitney division makes jet engines. Uh, we have 11,000 customers. Um, and in aggregate, our commercial engines have flown over a billion hours. Um, we power most of the, the um, excuse me, um, our United UTAS uh, division, aircraft systems, creates wheels and brakes um, and a number of other aircraft systems. Otis, of course, is the largest elevator company in the world. Every three days, Otis moves the equivalent of the entire population of the world. Um, <laughs> Here, he asked me to give this to you. That's so. good. <laughs> Let me just, wow. just, just, where's the switch? All right. Sorry, just switching mics here. All right. That's still working? More or less. All right, great. Um, and then finally, uh, our climate controls and security. Um, you know, brands that everybody's heard of, like carrier air conditioning, but also fire suppression and safety. Just uh, really an, an incredibly important set of products. Um, so today, I, you know, I work for Pratt and Whitney, and I'm going to talk about a couple of things. I want to go through um, kind of the history of high-performance computing at Pratt and Whitney. Um, I'm going to talk about where we are now, and particularly our use of big data. Um, and I also want to try and, uh, at risk, talking to this august group, uh, talk a little bit. Uh, give you my thoughts on what I think is important um, for leaders in HPC field today, because I think there, there are some important actions for all of us. So just to get started, I want to show a, a, a brief video uh, of some of the history of our military jet engines. <laughs> And if anybody's wondering, we are hiring right now. <laughs> so, so let's just uh, talk about some of the things. I mean, just you saw just iconic aircraft, um, incredible technology on display. Let's talk about how we got there. Um, first of all, I want to introduce kind of what's in a jet engine, how a jet engine works. Let's do a 101. So um, there are two, two paths for the air to flow through a jet engine. You've got what's called the core. That's right here. Um, and what's happening is we're compressing the air um, in a series of stages of blades. We're mixing it with fuel, um, and that creates a lot of expansion, which is used to drive the turbine, which is the back end. Think of it as a windmill. That windmill drives the big fan on the front, and that actually bypasses. That's this big bypass air here that, um, that actually moves the plane. Now, there's some inherent compromises in this. There's some challenges. Um, for best efficiency and noise, the fan really wants to go pretty slowly and move a mass of air. Um, but for best efficiency, the, the, the turbine and the core really wants to go fast. So as we're doing that design, we really need to do a lot of, of calculations to optimize that, those kinds of compromises in the engine and get the best performance possible. So starting in the 50s, um, we really didn't use a lot, a lot of computing. We had uh, Frieden calculators. There's still a handful of them kicking around Pratt & Whitney just for museum pieces. Um, and this gas turbine computer, I think, is just amazing. It's actually kind of a specialized slide rule. Um, and this was really the, the, these were the tools that, that some of these incredible machines were designed with. Now, when you think about the data that we got off engines at those times, we had log books. It was paper. Um, and, and that was really the, the, the way data came out of the, the individual flights. Interestingly enough, we've still got reams of paper out there from, from all of those engines. In the 60s, we started to actually start using computers in design. Uh, we had a series of Univacs. Uh, we had, so we had um, IBM mainframes as well. Uh, these are the, the picture on the right is actually from Pratt & Whitney. Um, and 
I, we actually still have an engineer in our structures division who um, remembers using a univac, and he's still working at Pratt all these years later. So, so uh, people take this seriously. He's, he says he's not going anywhere. Um, now, <laughs> and the data coming off the engine, if, if we took it off at all, it came off on tape. So you really, you know, it, it was not something that was real time or anything else like that. Now, there's one other kind of interesting thing about this picture that I noticed as I was putting this pitch together. At least the, old, the, the older folks will, will recognize this. Um, in one little corner, if you just blow up this picture, there's an IBM Think sign from, <laughs> from our data center. So uh, lost, to, lost to history, but it's still in the photo. Yep, exactly. So um, in the 70s, the, the mainframe really took over. Um, and again, we were still using very much reduced order methods, um, very simplistic methods, really, just to kind of understand some basic calculations within the engine. Um, we had some, now the engines were actually had electromechanical devices to count certain system events. Um, but again, we're not really pulling a lot of data off the machine. But some really iconic technology came out of that, right? The Boeing 747, for example, the F-15 straight up flight. Um, just incredible uh, capabilities. So the thing that really started to change, it was, it was really the 1980s um, that really started to change um, how computing got done. Because really when we bought our first Cray, that was when we actually started being able to use computational fluid dynamics a little bit in the design process. Now, the Cray was a great machine. It was absolutely the, the, the best thing we, available at the time. Um, but it w we only had one of them. Um, and in order to do design, we really would have needed a whole bunch. And so what typically happened was somebody would submit their job. Um, they'd wait 24 hours in queue. Uh, and then they'd find that they'd put one little error in their input deck. And you know they had to do the whole process again. So, it, it wasn't as, as great as we, we would have liked, but it certainly showed some potential. Now, a gentleman at Pratt & Whitney uh, just recently retired, uh, and he gave me a book. I forgot to grab it out of my bag, but I just want to take this out. This here is a report entitled, The Influence of Computational Fluid Dynamics on Experimental Aerospace Facilities, a 15-Year Projection. This came out in 1983. It was really is this CFD thing really going to take off? And what's it going to do to engine testing? And uh, in the abstract or the summary, it says, over the next 15 years, it's expected that CFD and ground test facilities will be used in a complementary mode with no appreciable reductions in testing. OK. <laughs> so let's fast forward about five to 10 years. Um, we totally crushed testing. We cut testing in half. And we made much, much better engines. And the reason was because all of a sudden, we have discovered distributed computing. And it wasn't that these guys, you know, if you read who actually came up with this report, it's an absolute who's who of the high performance computing experts at the time. But they didn't realize the, the, the disruptive power of distributed computing. Um, we actually started out on workstations um, some guys got kind of tired of that 24-hour wait for the Cray, and they said, you know, we got all these new Sun workstations on our desk. Can we use those? And clearly a Sun was no match for a Cray, but what if we could get 10 of them together and somehow make them talk and work? Um, and what we didn't realize was we were independently inventing uh, grid computing. We wrote a system called Prowess, which had its own message passing, its own process control. Um, and it allowed us to actually create a grid of thousands of workstations. Um, and we used that very extensively for design. Um, when we didn't have enough workstations on desks anymore, we started buying them and putting them first on tables and then on racks. Um, and, and it just really fundamentally changed things. Because for the first time, you could run multiple data points. You could do this within the design cycle. Um, and we could try multiple configurations. So instead of having to go out and actually modify something we could go, you know, modify a physical device and then go test it again. Uh, we could do things virtually. Um, in terms of the, the data coming off the engines, now we're starting to get some real data coming off of the, off of the machines that we have. But it's still very much a manual process. It's just more data. 
Um, and we didn't do a whole lot with it. You know, people would look at individual things. Finding data starts to become a difficulty. So distributed computing and prowess was great. Uh, we eventually obsoleted it. Um, the thing that really changed that was commodity clusters. Um, and now all of a sudden you could buy something where you didn't have to worry about whether somebody was going to come in and use his computer in the evening or, or you know, some, we had problems sometimes. Somebody, somebody came and unplugged a, a workstation at night to plug in a vacuum cleaner, right? All those problems went away. Um, now we had great dedicated resources, much larger resources, and we could really start exploring the design space. Um, and design space explore, exploration is really important. If you think about it, the first thing you do is you test the nominal, right? So here's the perfect design. I'm going to test it at the operating point, and I'm going to get some kind of result that says how my engine's going to, going to operate if I build it exactly like the nominal design and if I run it at exactly the operating point. But we know in reality none of that's true, right? Engines vary. Um, we run it at a whole bunch of different points, fast, slow, higher, lower, hotter, all those kinds of things. So now we're able to really explore. The other thing is we start to explore the um, multidisciplinary, so structures and aero, right? The structures guys would really like to build bricks. The aero guys would really like to build razor blades, right? Neither of them is right, so how do you, how do you bring those things together? So let's revisit our engine design for a moment. We talked about the fact that um, there's a compromise in there. One of the things that Pratt & Whitney had been working on for a long time was how do we get rid of that compromise, right? And it turns out if you could build an incredibly powerful gearbox, an incredibly reliable gearbox, you could actually spin the fan slower, you could make a much bigger fan, and you could spin the core faster the way it really wants to run. That allows you to take a whole lot of components out, um, and it allows you to get a much better, um, much better efficiency. So um, this engine has double-digit improvements in fuel burn and emissions. It's much, much quieter, lower maintenance cost because it's got less parts. Um, and that was what our geared turbofan, which is now dubbed the uh, pure power engine. Um, this is just a, a, a groundbreaking product for us. And HPC has been used really throughout. So if you look at how this engine has been developed, really you're looking at high performance computing through the entire life cycle. From conceptual design where we take very low order models uh, and we iterate through them thousands of times to figure out the best general configuration, to detailed design where we get into the actual physics of, of the individual components and subassemblies, um, manufacturing, and then another area that's really become very important to us actually came to us from the business areas. When we sell these engines now, our customers really would like predictability for their costs. Um, and Pratt & Whitney actually offers fleet management programs, power by the hour. So we basically manage the engine for them. We do the repairs. We take care of all of that. What we really want to do is figure out What's the optimal way to do that? How do we maximize time on wing? How do we be predictive for the customer? Um, and that started out, as I mentioned, kind of on the business side. Uh, they had a series of, they were doing these, some, some basic predictions. Um, but they came to us because really they just didn't have enough computing. Today that runs on the same kinds of resources that, um, that we use for regular engineering calculations. So, I'm going to give you an example of, of why this is so important. Um, and it's a non-technical example. Imagine you're, you're on a plane, you're ready to go somewhere, you push back from the gate, you're waiting in line to take off, and all of a sudden the captain comes on the, on the phone and says, you know, we're sorry, there's a, there's a light on the dashboard and we've got to go back, right? That's really disruptive for you. It's really disruptive for the airline as well, right? If that plane comes out of the schedule, that can disrupt everything all over the country. So what we're really working on doing is bringing together data that we've been collecting from many different sources um, and using that to be more predictive. So for example, we have a system called ICE, the Interval Cost Inter uh, um, Estimator. It's running multiple scenarios for engine life across different fleets. And it's bringing together very disparate data, design data, 
um, configurations of engines as delivered, maintenance records, environmental data, flying out of Heathrow is different environmental conditions and, and does different things to the engine from, the, for example, you know, flying out of Lima. Um, you know, and health monitoring information as well. What we're really trying to get to there is, is to be 100% aligned with our customer. We want our customer experience to be optimal. Um, we want to be predictive. We want to call them um, rather than having them call us, you know, and say your, your engine is ready. Um, and we really want speed to data, speed to knowledge. Now there's some challenges, of course. That data is in a lot of different formats. And when you're trying to bring it all together, um, you know, we're still working on things like cleanliness of data and, and how, you, how you bring these disparate systems together. It also changes the way you think about your compute clusters, too. You know, if you're running a traditional cluster with, with um, computational fluid dynamics, pretty much everything's about write and checkpoint. Now, all of a sudden, everything's about read and moving data in. The other thing that's interesting is, you know, when, when I first got into this business, we talked just incessantly about CPU, latency, bandwidth. Now we talk about data movement, right? How do we move data in? How do we move data out? Um, you know, how much Hadoop do we want in our cluster, et cetera? Um, so very, very different way of thinking, but incredibly powerful, right? This data, this data really, uh, until you can turn it into a value proposition, it's useless. Um, and so really being able to bring those pieces together is very, very important. So let's talk a little bit about where we see high-performance computing going. For want of a better term, I call it HPC plus. Um, it's really HPC plus Hadoop. It's HPC plus business systems, HPC plus IoT. Um, we're really seeing all of these interconnections with our high-performance computing operation. These non-traditional things that other people did are really important to us. Um, it makes you think about high-performance computing in different ways. Um, if, for example, your shop floor execution is feeding process control data through your high-performance computing, and your shop floor is on 24-7, you better be on 24-7, right? Um, and, and so that kind of reactiveness, that kind of constant flow, is a very different way of thinking about HPC from what we've had in the past. I mean, don't get me wrong. If we ever went down, the customers went bananas. But, but this is a whole different deal when, when it now part delivery and everything else depends on it. So, um, but it's exciting. I mean, it's, it's really exciting stuff. Um, and just if you bring that big data capability together with analytics, you can do so much. Because you can actually explore the design space, generate a whole bunch of simulations, and then interrogate them for, you know, what things are really important? What lessons can you learn out of that? Um, the other thing is you can use data to inform what you're going to do for a simulation. So it goes both ways. Oops. All right. So finally, I just want to talk for a couple of minutes about um, what I think this community uh, really needs to do for high-performance computing. Um, I would say that this group really represents high-performance computing leadership, and, and th we've, just, we've got some work to do as a group. Um, first of all, suppliers, pe people, a number of people always ask me, you know, well, if I want to be a supplier to Pratt & Whitney, what do I have to do? Um, the number one thing that I tell everybody is, I don't want you to just sell us stuff. You have to actually share ownership of our success. Um, when we do a project, we actually talk about with a project with a company, we often get together and we actually talk about, you know, this is the engine, these are our goals for the technology. Um, with the actual folks who are going to be delivering the equipment or the architects of the cluster or what have you. I don't care if, you're, if you are one of the design engineers or the guy who puts the plastic ends on, on network wires, right? You own a piece of, of, of what you just saw there. Right? And everybody has to feel that because it's not made up, it's true. That's just really important. Um, software licensing remains a challenge. You know, we're continuing to scale up. Uh, scalable licensing, I think, is the other thing that's, that's definitely something that we continue to look for. Um, for the labs, I think there are a number of things that, we're really, that we really need. First of all, the labs provide what I call next generation capability now. 
Um, and that's very important. The machines that we buy today um, are going to be well, they're going to be full tomorrow. But not only that, but no matter, even a company like United Technologies can't field the kind of capabilities that the labs are. And that really does two things for us. It allows us to evaluate technologies that we can't evaluate any other way. Um, and it allows us to develop the tools so that they are ready when that next generation of computers comes along. And that's been incredibly, incredibly important. You know, we've had very positive relationships with the labs, and that's, that's really been helpful. Um, we still need help with scaling, uh, in, especially in what we call the multis, multi-physics, multidisciplinary. Um, you know, these are, these are big challenges for us. There's still a long way to go there. Um, and there's a lot of really valuable science in terms of things like fuel burn and, and, and everything else. Um, and then really robustness of software tools. I, I sometimes feel like it's very, well, it would be very easy for, for somebody to get so wrapped up in that big stunt that they forget that we've got to do it every day. And so, you know, things like MPI, just incredibly, incredibly successful project because it's an, enable, an enabler across the entire industry. Um, and it's something that, where, that had kind of robustness built in. There were some really great ideas that didn't get into the MPI standard simply because they couldn't be implemented by everybody or they couldn't be implemented robustly. And I think that was one of the just brilliant things about the, about the MPI forum. Um, finally, I want to talk a little bit about just people in HPC leadership in general. Um, one of the reasons why I gave examples of, of where we missed um, is because I think that's a, that's a kind of a, a, a learning moment for all of us. Um, and we really have to help people learn and, and grow. Um, one of the things I'd love to see for, from everybody is we have to develop more HPC literate engineers. We're going to hire 1,000 engineers this year. Practically all of them who are coming in know very little about HPC. Um, and usually May hits and, you know, everything breaks loose on the clusters because, <laughs> we, you know, people are trying stuff. They don't know what they don't know. Um, some of it turns out to be great, but a whole lot of it turns out to be kind of rookie errors and, and things like that. So the more we can do with that, the better, um, just in terms of, of building that capability. Um, we need to, especially at the high end, we need to communicate to the general public what High, why, what the value of high performance computing is to them. Um, there is a growing disparity between what we can do with high performance computing and the public's understanding of what we're doing with high performance computing. And I think that's, that's potentially dangerous and I think it's also problematic from a funding standpoint. You know, people understand that, um, you know, they're getting a 10 day forecast instead of a three day forecast now. They understand that cars are safer but they don't understand that that's because people are running you know, tens of thousands of, sorry, tens of millions of elements in LS Dyna simulations to make that happen. Um, you know, somebody gets an Uber and they kind of got a, an idea of, of what it, you know, how that works, but they don't realize that somebody went out to the cloud and processed millions of miles of road yesterday in order to make that possible, right? If the public doesn't understand it, they may not value it, and they may also kind of reject it. And I think that's, that's where you, what you see sometimes in the climate science discussion and some of these other things. People just don't understand the science well enough to even know what we're talking about. And that becomes critically important for something like exascale, where it's not immediately obvious to everybody why that's important. Think back to that Cray for a moment, right? If I had told you in, in 1987 that Someday, everybody will have that in their pocket, and it will be life-changing. How many of us would have believed that? Right? It happened, right? So I can't tell you everything that Exascale is going to do for us, um, but it's really important that people understand that trajectory. Um, and finally, I just want to say, we've all got to think bigger than we think, right? It's, it's really easy to point at places where we missed or whatever. Um, we're in a great business in that there's always something new. Everything is always expanding exponentially. It's really easy to fall behind the curve. And for those of us who have been doing this for a long time and who are very experienced, um, it's even easier for us to fall behind the curve because we already know how it's supposed to be, right? And we got to think about how it's going to be. 
Um, you know, we can't lose that wonder. We can't lose that possibility because we're, we've really got to inspire that next generation to really be pushing that. So with that, I'll take any questions. Hey, Pete, thanks very much. That was so interesting. First off, you mentioned you're going to be hiring a number of engineers. Um, I don't know if you noticed, unfortunately, that Boeing is laying off a number of engineers. So <laughs> maybe you yeah. can, uh, maybe there's a match here and some of those folks uh, can, can make their way east. Yeah, I, I don't think we're being subtle about it. So, um, you know, yeah, we, we are literally hiring 1,000 engineers this year and another 1,000 next year. I mean, we're, it's just, it's a really good time right now for, for U.S. citizen engineers. Boy. They're not being subtle about their layoff either, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. that, but that's exciting that you're growing and that you need that much. Yeah. Um, that, that's really exciting. Pete, I guess my question is kind of in the, you're talking about the wonder and what could be. What do you see um, your problem set looking like in five years, especially as you consider exascale uh, coming down the pike? What does it look like in terms of you know, melding modeling and simulation with data analytics, for example, which is kind of a new field that you're talking about right now, what you're doing at least internally. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely not new for us, but it is really important. I think the challenge just is those dimensions. Um, you know, you've got part variation, you've got um, how the thing is, operates, and when you start thinking about even something like a design of experiment, somebody else was mentioning the same thing. Mm -hmm. You so quickly into get, get into more dimensions than anybody can possibly imagine today. But that would be really useful, right? I mean, we spend a lot of time cutting those down into something that will fit into the computers. Um, you know, I'm, I was talking to Doug earlier. I think one of the other areas that we've really got to think about is at a certain point, capacity computing becomes capability computing, right? If I want to do a DOE, with many, many 10,000 core jobs. Yeah, in theory, I could run that on a 10,000 core cluster. It's a, it's a capacity problem, right? But if I want to do that in a business useful fashion, I could very easily need one of the largest supers in the, in the world to, to pull that off. Merle. I'm getting nervous. Merle's going to ask me a question here. <laughs> Pete, great description of the HPC Plus and needing to think beyond where we are today. Where do you look for that inspiration? Is the HPC community itself, uh, I can't imagine it would just only be one community, but what else is needed for you to get the inspiration? What has Cloud done for you? What has other places done for you? You're trying to merge HPC simulation and plus data and plus a bunch of other things. Where do you go for that? I, I think the biggest inspiration actually comes from the individual disciplines. You know, whether, whether you're into to, you know, oil and gas discovery, pharmaceuticals, whatever it is, there are just, you know, when I was growing up, I was kind of disappointed because I thought everything had been, been invented already, you know, and, and I wanted to be an inventor. I think the great thing about this field is there's always something new to invent. It doesn't matter what discipline we're in. Um, there are things that are just plain impossible right now. And you can see those over the horizon, and, and we all have to help get there. So in our area, of course, you know, as I mentioned, multi-physics, um, but also just turbulence modeling, something, some turbulence modeling and combustion. Um, very, very challenging problems, very, very important for fuel burn, for engine life, for all of these, these other things. Um, we got a lot of things to solve there that, that our you know, computing doesn't begin to, to be able to touch right now. All set? Great, Great. thank you.